reading. Have you ever had to say this to anyone? On a bus, in a cafe, maybe even at home? For some of us, it's a way of life. I'm going to tell you about a book, a person, a group of people, and an idea. First, raise your hand if you know someone you would describe as extroverted. And raise your hand if you know someone you would describe as introverted. Now raise your hand if you dislike raising your hand in public for questions such as these. <laughs> if so, you too might be an introvert. The person I'll tell you about is Susan Cain. Her book, Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking. The group of people, introverts. The idea, that rather than being a deficit or something to be pitied or overcome, introversion is a personality trait that has distinct advantages in schools, offices, even politics and leadership. I'll introduce Kane's work, challenge you to think of introversion in a new way, and explain why her book is important to me. Kane writes that introverts and extroverts differ in the amount of external stimulation that they need in order to function well. For example, software developer and philanthropist Bill Gates is known for spending hours at a time in his office behind closed doors in quiet contemplation of his next big idea. Bill Gates will never be Bill Clinton, Kane writes, and Bill Clinton will never be Bill Gates, but we need both Bills to be who they naturally are. We must consider what is lost when we try to cure people of their introversion or bring them out of their shells. Having quiet time to think creatively without distractions or peer pressure is how some of us do our best work whereas others thrive in the company of their competitors or advisors. This matters because the United States is sometimes biased toward extroverts. The spoils of modern life often go to the most outspoken, gregarious, or fun-loving among us. But why should this be? Kane's research starts in schools, where educators weigh in on the relative merit of encouraging, praising, or rewarding verbal participation by all kids in a school classroom. Some students, maybe those who find themselves more on the introverted end of the spectrum, might make their primary contribution to a classroom discussion by actively and attentively listening to their classmates. I'm sure my fellow Toastmasters will agree that listening is an important leadership skill, not to mention a veritable form of participation. How did we get here? Participation is also very highly valued in the workplace, where advancement and promotions often go to those who speak the most or the loudest around the conference table. That can be a disincentive to hardworking introverts who'd rather skip the meeting altogether and return to their cubicles. That is, of course, unless they work in the dreaded open floor plan. Kane writes that our national story and some of our American traditions are deeply rooted in what she calls the extrovert ideal. This was partly spurred on by the popularity and success of Dale, of Dale Carnegie and the turn of the 20th century's uh, emphasis on urbanism, industrialism, even the rise of Hollywood movie stars. All of this led to marketing campaigns, classes, and other personal growth products designed to attune people to the outer world rather than to the life of the mind. But not everyone can or should live up to this ideal. Kane relates the story of Isaac Newton, a known introvert, as he discovered the law of gravity. If you're out in the yard, sitting under a tree, she writes, rather than clinking glasses on the patio, you're more likely to have an apple fall on your head. <laughs> Thus the central idea of Kane's book, that a lack of social distraction can lead to a world of discovery. Being an introvert does not necessarily mean that you lack confidence, nor that you fear public speaking. <clears throat> I'll offer myself as an example. I'm not your stereotypical introvert. 
I'm not shy, nor do I speak in a low volume. I am, however, certified by the Myers-Briggs Corporation as an introvert. I used to think of myself as an extrovert, a people person even. But over the years, I've been more honest with myself about how little I enjoy things like networking or small talk. I prefer big talk. I would rather ask you, what are you afraid of? And have 30 minutes to deeply discuss it, rather than quickly or superficially ask, what do you do? I loathe being asked this by hairdressers, strangers on an airplane or at a wedding. I can't tell you how many offices I've worked in, where I've gone to the break room hoping to refresh my batteries, and uh, refresh myself, recharge my batteries, sitting down with a book or a magazine, when some well-meaning co-worker who feels sorry for me will come up, sit down next to me and say, you're all by yourself. The worst is the attention you get when you come back from a sick day and everybody wants to know what's wrong. I prefer to keep the details of my sick days and my personal life private. Because you know what's great about privacy? Everything. <laughs> my coming out party as an introvert was in Mexico in 2012. I was staying in a group house with some friends who surfed all day and partied all night. I spent the entire week on the beach with a biography of Joni Mitchell, watching the whale tails leap and fall into the ocean. For me, that was a perfect vacation. Even if you're not an introvert, Kane says the odds are you're probably managing, raising, married to, or coupled with one. Susan Cain has freed millions of people to live without stigma and be who they naturally are. Remember the name, Susan Cain. Mr. Tessman.